to no man's opinion, no sermon, no worship song, just his promise. And the Bible says in the Old Testament that he's Jehovah Nisi. That's God our banner. The thing I like about that is it doesn't put a title to that banner because there's so many different quali qualities of God. There's so many different characteristics of God. And sometimes we need God to be the banner of love. Sometimes we need him to be the banner of faith. Sometimes we need him to be the banner of healing. Sometimes we need him to be the banner of victory in our life. Sometimes it's freedom. But here's the beautiful thing is that when they went out to war in Israel back in the day, they always had a banner that was out front. When you look at the Civil War, when you look at any war that we've been in, what goes in the very front line? The flag, the banner. Why? Because that's what you're declaring. That is what you're declaring on the front line. And, and you know, the enemy is in a battle for your soul. This world's in a battle for your soul. And, and I got news for us. This world's in a battle for your kids. And we either show up on the front line and we say, uh-uh, God is my banner. He is my truth. He's my holiness and righteousness. And his word, his anthem, his promise in his word tells me how to raise my kids. No government, no school, no politician, no counselor, just God. And we could either show up on the front line or cower back and say, oh, I'll let somebody else deal with that. Well, let somebody else deal with that, and we'll see where you get. Or we could show up on that front line and say, I'm going to war. <laughs> I'm going I'm to take a stand. I'm going to go to war here. Because whether we like it or not, as Christians, that's exactly where we're at. We're at war. At war. And we can either cower back and, and, and you know, kind of like when the Vietnam War happened and people flew to Canada and became cowards, or we can show up when we're, our number is called and say, hey, I'm going to stand in for the nation. I may not agree with the fight, but you know what? I agree with the freedom. I agree with the flag. And I may not always agree what goes on in this world. I may not always agree this way, or I may not always agree how God does it. But you know what? If God shows up and says go to war, I agree with God just simply because he's God. And I'm going. I'm showing up. I'm going to the battle line. And sometimes when you go to the battle line, you know what you do? You make a mess. <laughs> There's some things you got to get rid of. There's some things you can't take with you. That's okay. Because when you show up at the battle line, God's going to do something every time. Because he says when you go to battle, it's not the stone, it's not the sword, it's not the rock, it's not what we can say or do. The Spirit of God is the one that goes and fights our victories. But we have to get off our old fanny and do something about it. <laughs> And once we do that, God begins to do some amazing, amazing things. And so I'm going to give this over to Skip this morning. He's got a message, I believe, that is going to really inspire and touch your heart this morning. And we leave the kids in here this morning. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, Okay. Skip, 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 skip speaking to us this morning. Y'all want to listen on what he's got to say? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to hand this over to Skip. And I know this has been burning in him for what, a month yeah, or more. For, yeah, for, for two months. So I can't wait to hear it. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. I haven't heard the word fanny since the 1980s. I don't know where that is. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Kiddos are, I, I really, it really blessed my heart to see you guys worship this morning. Amen. Wasn't it good to worship the Lord? You know, the Lord, he doesn't say just to sit on your fannies and worship him. He says, give a shout, give joy, dance. And sing. Amen. And you kids were an example of that. So I'm, I'm proud of you.
So I want to see that every Sunday. Can we do that every Sunday? Can I set out a couple Sundays, please? No, I love you guys. I love you guys. Yeah, um, it's like Pastor was saying, um, the Lord is, um, he's placed the, uh, uh, the book of Joshua on my heart for the last two or three months. And, uh, and when he places something on your heart, like scripture, you will see multiple things happen in this journey. You'll see where he, he'll put you at certain verses. He'll speak through you through dreams. And sometimes he'll give you words for somebody. And, uh, I will let you know that, you know, I very seldom have words for Pastor Roger, but he gave me a word for Pastor Roger out of the book of Joshua. And um, it's a blessing um, to be able to have that communication with God where God tells you, this is where I want you. This is where I want you to be right now in this, in this season, uh, being the book of Joshua. And I've learned so much um, from the book of Joshua and... Um, it's Old Testament, but it it speaks to us um, as believers, where we're at as believers right now, and where we came from, amen? And how did we get there, who got us there, and why, amen? So we're going to be in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 14. 15. This message I entitled Freedom for Me and My House. So in verse 14 it reads, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in, and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. Verse 15. And if it is a disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father God, I, we, we love you. We love you. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your promise. And just as that worship song was talking about clinging on to you, we want to cling on to you this morning. We want all the distractions to be gone. We just want to cling on to you. We thank you for what you're about to do this morning. We thank you for what you've done and what you're about to do. We, we ask that, um, that you just bless us and, and let us know what we need to know today. Let us know that you'll never abandon us. Let us know that you're always there for us. Let us know that you are our God and we will serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Joshua, the book of Joshua. Joshua, if anybody doesn't know, he came after Moses. So Moses, you guys know that God uses Moses to what? To talk to the people, right? To send the word of God to the people. So Moses was, I guess you would say, the middleman between the people and God. Amen? Amen. He was a godly man, but he was a middleman. But he, God used them, just like he uses you guys. Oakley, he uses you. God uses you, yeah, to bring the word. So when Moses died, Joshua was next in line. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the, the, um, the responsibility of stepping up behind Moses? Yeah, big shoes to fill. So God's like, okay, Joshua. Um, Moses is gone now. I'm going to let you be in charge. We still have a big plan. We still have to get these folks over to the promised land. And Joshua says, oh, okay. So the Lord spoke to Joshua, and uh, 
Joshua's, uh, you know, Joshua, he prayed and asked for strength. And um, we all should do that. And, uh, and when it comes to freedom, freedom in Christ means everything to us. Amen? Hey, there's my brother, Brother Willis. Everybody welcome, Brother Willis. I got a hug of his neck, man. Thank you for coming, brother. You okay? You okay? He lives down in Kansas City, and he's, he's traveled a little bit, so you made it. He told me he was going to be here. So so we're talking about freedom in Christ, uh, which means everything to us. Um, as leaders of our house, we must take a stand, like Pastor Roger was talking about, stand and going to war and standing on the front line. As leaders of the house, we must take a stand. What was the last sentence that Joshua said in that verse? But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, couldn't you imagine him saying that? Couldn't you imagine how bold, you know, he was saying, he was saying that statement? You know, I can just see him, you know, for me... You know, being bold and making a point. In my house, we will serve the Lord. If you look in those verses, uh, Brother Willis, we're at uh, Joshua chapter 4, verse 14 and 15. Um, and if you look at verse, um, verse 15, you will see that they were saying, okay, you have a, you have a choice. We all have a choice, right, to who we're going to serve and who we're going to worship, right? And that is how good our God is. Our God loves us so much that says, you know what, I'm going to give you the choice. I'm going to see what you're going to do. And and God gave these folks that were wanting to make it to the promised land a choice. You have a choice to worship the God gods you did in Egypt, or you can come across this river to the promised land that I promised you, and worship me. So if you look, if you read uh, verse 15, it says, Whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're, you're living. So he let them know exactly where, he was, where they were and who they were serving. So I wrote down six things. Uh, highlights of freedom. What does freedom uh, in Christ give us? And uh, number one, I wrote freedom from the world. Ah, uh, now if you go to you go to First John chapter four verse five, you'll read that how how Christ gives us freedom from the world. Number two, freedom from religion. Amen on that, huh? Woo! And you'll see in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 27, it will read, tell you about the, the freedom that we receive from Christ from a religion. Number three, freedom to worship in truth. What does that look like? Freedom to worship in truth. That's in John, chapter 8, 32, or Galatians, chapter 2, verse 5. Worship in truth means what do we stand for? Do we stand on, do we pick a part of the Bible, whatever we want to use that day, or we want to preach? Do we just pick certain things and leave some things out? Or do we use the entire word of God and we stand on that? That's truth. And that's worship. That's worship. Worshiping just what those kiddos did this morning was worshiping in truth because the Lord told him that's how we worship that's how i want you because he's a jealous god and he wants it all he wants it all and he and those kiddos gave it their all to him number four freedom to serve the lord that goes right back to joshua about here's your choice you have a choice you have you have a choice to serve these gods that your fathers did in egypt or you have a choice to serve me so i have a uh, luke Chapter 4, verse 8 on that. 
Number five, freedom to minister to our family. Christ gives us the freedom to minister to our family. And uh, can I use you for example, Aaron? Yeah, she blesses me. She truly blesses me. When Aaron is a single mother that's raising two kids, you've got work, you've got chores, you've got housework, you've got bills. But above all that, she ministers to these kiddos. Christ gives her the freedom and the strength to minister to in, to minister to these kids. That's our number one. That's our number one. You know, and minister ministering to your family looks different in some ways to other. You know, to some families. Sometimes it's just um, reading scripture with them every night. Sometimes it's just praying with them. Sometimes it's going to church with them. Sometimes it's it's um, it's going to kids camp. Sometimes it's it's uh, enrolling them in a Christian school. That's ministry. Amen. So thank you, God, for that. And number six, the final one. You ready? This is my favorite one. You ready? Christ gives us freedom to preach the gospel. Ooh. Now, I know you guys know about the uh, the far countries, um, China and other countries that don't have the freedom to preach the gospel. What happens to them, Pastor, if they're preaching the gospel on the street? They could be killed. We're not we're not beating around no bush this morning. They could be killed. Sometimes they get in prison. But mostly they don't mess around with them because they know if they can take the Christians out right off the bat, they don't have to deal with them anymore. So what we have in this country, what we have is the freedom of speech. Now, let me tell you, every day as days go on, our chances of preaching the gospel in our streets is shrinking. So we have to take that stand that we talked about this morning. We have to take that stand and say, no, we're going to fight. We're Christians. This is what we believe in. This is the word of God. God told us, what's the Great Commission? Go make disciples from the east, the north, the south. Can I leave one out? But we're going to do that. Why? Because our God tells us to do that. And if we die, we die, but we die for him because we serve him. We choose to serve him. But as for me and my house, say it with me, but for has me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I messed you up at that beginning, didn't I? Amen. So how did Joshua... Joshua needed strength, right? Because he come after Moses. Moses did what he did. And Joshua come about and God spoke to him and said, I want you to lead, finish leading these folks. And Joshua was like, oh, man, I need some strength. But if you go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, it says, be strong and courageous, for you shall give these people possession of the land which I swore to their fa fathers to give them. So God's, God's telling Joshua, I made a promise. I made a promise. So I want you to be strong and courageous. He made the same promise to us. Sometimes we get down. Sometimes that we feel like, man, have we... Have I not have the strength? Am I I'm not am I not fighting the good fight? He said, be courageous. Be bold. Where do we get that? Where do we get that power from? The Holy Spirit. So we have to we have to ask for that um that strength. Um, you know, 
I, I keep God keeps sending me back to that worship song, that clinging to me in the night. Or have the rest of it go in the end of it, Angie. It's, I clinged on to you at the night, or I would have perished. Yeah, that that said something to me because I remember when I was in my addiction. There was sometimes, and Brother Willis will be he'll he'll testify on this too. When we're on our addiction and we feel like everything's dark and everything's. Uh, there's no hope. And the only thing we have is to cling on to him. And that got us through it. It got us through it. It wasn't like he says. It wasn't man. It wasn't music. It wasn't anything of the world. It was clinging on to him and his word and his promise. That's it right there. And that's what got us through. Um, and everybody has a testimony where there was times that you laid there in bed or you sat up in a chair and you said, God, I don't know where, I don't know what to do. God said, cling on to me because I'm not going to abandon you. And we have to keep that in mind. Have strength, have courage, be strong. We must conquer fear. The enemy What's his number one weapon, Aaron? The enemy. Fear. If he can strike fear into us and make us believe that we're not going to be able to conquer something, that's fear. And he uses that. Because he's a liar. Because we don't we don't have fear. We fear the Lord. But we don't fear anything of this world because he tells us. How many times does he tell us not to fear in the Bible? I, whew, there's a bunch, isn't there? It's quite. It's in there a lot. So, oh, man, you know, Joshua was looking at this mission. I want to call it a mission because it was a mission. He had to get these folks across this river to the promised land. What was in the way? What was between him and the river? What was between, you know? Armies that was trying to defeat them, that was trying to take them out. That's why he sent spies out. Say, you go check this out to me and see where they're at, see where they're going to attack us from. You get the opportunity. If nobody's ever read the whole book of Joshua, please read it. So let's talk about America. I'm going to throw some stats at you that's going to break your heart. Are you ready? Most Americans now say that they sell them 25% or 33% say never attend any kind of religious service, according to Gallup. Most children today have vastly different faith, faith experience than previous generations. You know, when I was talking about earlier about the generation now is the generation before would always come to church with their parents. The parents don't come now. So are the kids coming. Breaks my heart. So more than two in three, that's 67% Americans say they attended a faith service weekly or almost every week growing up. 67% say when their parents were growing, when they was growing up, they attended the same rate. That's not a bad number, is it? 67%? I mean, it could be better, but at least they was going, right? But now, um, according to adults with children under the age of 18, only 31% attend regularly. Whew. Yes. Yes. We need you. We need you, Lord. So biblical leadership is missing in the church. I'm going to say it. We have some churches in this country that are not teaching and preaching 
the Bible to these children. We have teachers and preachers in this country that are not teaching and preaching the word of God to the congregation, to the flock. They want to know why the world is going off track. Takes the church. That's right. It takes the church. You know, we're talking about for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. For me and my church, we will serve the Lord. Because it comes down to parents like Aaron, Chris, Letitia, to minister to the kids, but it's also our responsibility to minister to those kids. We go to the battle. We stand on that front line with that banner. We stand together, arms locked with the parents, and say, we're with you on this. And then you know what the devil does? What's the devil do, Angie? He flees. Because on our lips is the name above all names. Whew. <laughs> That's all we need, y'all. Jesus. Jesus. In the, in, the, in the book of James, in chapter 5, it says, If you proclaim the name of Jesus, the devil must flee. I don't know how many times I say, In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, get behind me, devil. Get behind me. Or better yet, get under my feet. Because the Lord has promised us, if we fight this battle and we proclaim the name of Jesus, he's under our feet. Amen? The need for godly leaders is necessary for transformation of churches and families. We need the leaders of the house to lead, protect, and provide both physically and spiritually. Paul gives us steps in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 on how to be leaders of God. He said we must pursue godliness, faith, love, preserver, I can't say that word, preserver nation, yeah, righteousness and gentleness. There you go. He laid it all out. You want to be a leader, walk in these. Walk in these. The pursue is also a present tense command. Okay? When it says when he says pursue, he's not saying, well, um, back in the day you do this. No, he's saying now. Pursue it now. Every day we must follow after the above mentioned steps that flow from our union with Christ. Christ gives us that union, which gives us freedom. Come on. Which gives us the steps, which gives us the leadership, which takes our children out of the enemy's claws. We have it, we have it all right here, y'all. We have it right here. God is telling us. He's knocking. Come on. I'm giving it to you. I laid it out to you. I'm telling you what you need to do. I told you. I gave you an example. I gave you people from the Old Testament. I gave you people the New Testament. I told you how to walk. I told you what you pursue. I told you how to cast that devil. Come on. Somebody the other day said, well, I don't know about this casting out demons. That's from the old. That's old. I said, no, no, no. Yeah, I should have been here last Sunday. Yeah. No, it's of today. And anymore, anymore, it seems like it, 
it intenses more every day, don't it? Don't it, Aaron? Aaron is a demon slayer. <laughs> I love doing street ministry with her. Because that, uh, what are you, a whole 90 pounds maybe? <laughs> 80 pounds? But she's got power. She's got power in the name of Jesus. Amen? You know, so it doesn't matter your size. It doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter what you know of the Bible. It doesn't know, doesn't matter who you hang around with. Or does it? Ah. I was, I was witnessing with a friend of mine the other day, and we was witnessing to these uh, folks. And uh, these folks were, you know, they had, they had some struggles. They had some strongholds. And uh, he told him, he says, you know what? We're just like you. I understand you. We're just like you. I had a, had a little talk with him afterward. I said, guess what, brother? I love you. And you know the Bible. But we're not like them. We're set apart. God gives us that freedom. Gives us that freedom to jump up here with these kids. And say, we have been set apart. We are righteous. We're godly. What's the rest of them? We have faith. We have love, love, gentleness, and righteousness. We're set apart. Now, was we there a long time? Yep, that's right. But the chains were broken when we said, Jesus, we need you. He broke the chain. We have the banner. We're set apart. So holiness is not just abstaining from certain actions. It's about pursuing God. Like a deer panting for water. Anybody know what that's from? Psalm 42.1. Do not just say no to sin, but say yes to God. That's pursuing. You know, I, we catch ourselves all the time. Says no, 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 no devil, no devil, no devil. Yeah, that's good to do that. Get behind me, devil. Yeah. First, let's say yes, God. Yes, God. Where do you want me? How do you want me to deal with this, God? Yes, God. Where do you want me to go, God? Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. And then then you go to battle. Then you say, come on, devil. What you got? But first, we've got to say yes to God. And 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. This talks about the leader of the house. He must be one who manages his own household well. Keeping his children under control with all dignity. Ooh. What's that look like, y'all? Managing his own household well. He lays it all out to us. How the leader of the house. Manages his own household. He lays it all out. Keeping his children under control with dignity. What's that look like? That's what that's teaching them. Teaching them. That's where dignity comes from, is teaching. Teaching them to honor their mother and father. Teaching them to honor other people, to respect other people, to show love. The greatest commandment is what? Love one another as yourself. That's dignity. That's how you teach your children. The Lord has loaned these kids to us. I said it the other day. I said, these ain't our kids. We have to be stewards of God's children. How serious is that? You know, when I... Uh, when I was called into the kids' ministry, um, 
I don't know how many times I had to say that this past week at kids camp. I was called. I didn't want to do it. I did just like Angie last week when she was talking about she w- was called to St. Joe. She didn't want to come here. I didn't want to go to kids. My ministry was prison ministry. My pri- my my ministry was alcoholics and addicts, but God said no. And he showed me why. And I said, yes, God. Yes, God. So being a kid's pastor, how serious is that? Serious. He loaned these children to us. I want to show you, um, as being leaders of the household, what you can do with your kids. I want to show you an example that we used at kids camp. And it's awesome. And they actually had books for them. I, I was going to bring a book, but I ended up giving it to my daughter. And and uh, I pray that she uses it. But it's called SOAP. Has anybody ever heard SOAP? It's S. Stands for scripture. O. Stands for observation. A. Stands for application. And P. Stands for prayer. You guys got that? Now, adults can use this, too. So, when you sit down with your kiddos, let's do scripture. Just do one scripture, okay? Let's do the Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15. Oh, what does it mean to me? What stands out to me? Who, where, why, okay? So, you write that down. A, the application. The application, how does it affect my life? So let's say that we did Joshua 24. That's the scripture. O, the observation. Let's say, well, it stood out to me was um, he was bold about making the statement about me and my house, but, but me and my house. And it stood out to me that God was giving these folks a choice to serve him or serve the other gods that were in Egypt. That stood out to me. The application was, I can learn from that because I can I can be bold and state that but me and my house will serve the Lord. Or you can say, you know, I can, I can lead people like Joshua did. I can be a Joshua. Who wants to be a Joshua? Yeah, yeah. And prayer, how can I pray over this scripture? How can I pray that God uses me as he used Joshua? Isn't that good? Soap. I never heard of it until this week. It was really good. So we must prepare to be ready for the return of Christ. Amen? He's coming. He's coming. Should we tell our children that he's coming? That's, that's right. They know. We have to. I mean, we have We have to let. You know, I, I know there's a lot of churches out there that don't even mention the coming of, of Christ. Shame on them. Because how many times did the Lord tell us in the scripture that you be ready? You be ready. Because in Luke, chapter Luke, chapter 12, Jesus has a parable that talks about this. And he says about the head of the household to be ready. In verse 39 and 40, in verse 39, he says, and be sure of this. What's that, what's that mean? What's he mean to be? But you be sure of this. That means this is it right here, bud. Be sure that you understand this. You understand that you comprehend this. Because there is so much on the line. Amen? So much on the line. That if the head of the household had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have allowed his house to be broken into. In verse 40, you too be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Peter, I love Peter. Peter 
always asks those questions that we would probably ask, would, didn't he? <laughs> wouldn't he? He says, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? So he's like, so Peter was like, is this just for us disciples that hanging out with you or is this for everybody else? The Lord said, when then is the faithful and the sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? It's for everybody. It's for everybody. Be ready. Tell your kids to be ready. Kids, are you ready? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 2, it reads, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And in verse 2, it reads, In this case, moreover, it is required of a steward that one be found trustworthy. What does that word trustworthy mean? When the Lord tells us to be stewards of our families, our flock, and to be found trustworthy, that's a lot of responsibility to us, isn't it? But we have to be trustworthy. We have to say, yes, God, I will watch over your children. I will teach your children. I will pray over your children. Whew. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God gives us freedom from strongholds. God gives us freedom of bondage. He's, he saved me. I was in bondage. I was wrapped up in chains. There was no other way to get out of that bondage but through Christ. Chris, you want to be my volunteer? Sorry about that. Are you able to minister to those kids in bondage, in chain? The devil dangled those keys in front of you and said, Chris, you're never going 
to see freedom. I've got you. But what did you do to break to get those keys? What did you do? You cried out. You clinged. You cling to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And he said, Chris, I'll never abandon you. I hear you. I hear your cries. And he said, Chris, I've got the key. The devil does not have the key. I have the key. Chris, I'm going to give you freedom. He took the key and unlocked the padlock. And all of a sudden, the layers, the layers of chains, bondage, slavery started coming. You started seeing the light. You started, no, you started proclaiming in the name of Jesus. And eventually you said, my Lord, my Lord, me and my household will serve the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I love you, brother. That's my brother right there. I'm so proud of him. He's come such a long ways. And trust me, he serves. Him and his family serve the Lord. And there's times that we've had that, you know, sometimes we, co we question ourselves, are we doing enough? Does God tell you to ask yourself, are we doing enough? enough? What's he tell you? I'm enough. He's enough. So we have to be strong and be courageous. Kiddos, can you say be strong? Be courageous. All right. That's awesome. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it reads, As each one has received a special gift. You, did, you know, did you guys know, kiddos, did you know that you received a special gift? Anaya, you've received a special gift. Yep. Employ it in serving one another. He has gave you a gift to serve one another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So God's given us that gift of being good stewards. Have you guys ever seen me do a message without quoting Pastor Roger? No, it's at least once. I want to I want to read uh, out of his uh, one of his books, the emotion emotional roller coasters in the life of freedom. And this, when I read this, it just boom hit me. And he writes, "If we want freedom and peace in our lives, we must let go of the situation and deny its rights to hindering our growth." Huh? If we want freedom and peace in our lives, we must let go of the situation and deny its rights to hinder our growth. That's speaking to you, Brother Willis. Yeah. I think that was a word for you right there, bro. Whew. God gives us the freedom to be able to let go of these situations. If we're in chains and bondage, we don't have the opportunity to break loose of that situation because that situation is stuck to us and it's hindering us and it's holding us down. But with the freedom of Christ, 
we can release, we can release, we can deny. I love the part where you said deny its rights. Deny its rights. That's like we're taking a stand. Aaron, what do we say when, we pre when we're praying over people and we're praying against the devil? We say, devil, you have no authority. So let's call this out on the situation that hinders us. Because we cannot grow in the Lord unless we call them out, call the situations out that hinders us, that holds us down. Call them out. Call them out. How many times have you heard this church proclaim that? I did a survey last week. I surveyed a, surveyed a non-believer, and I asked, I, get, I asked for his permission to use his answers, and he said, I could. I surveyed, a, I surveyed a believer. I said, give me four. Four things that come to mind about freedom. And the non-believer said, I'm going to give you his top four. You ready? Which are really, they're good. Number one, he said, I want to be a good provider. That gives me freedom. Freedom means I'm a good provider. He, number two, he said, I want to, uh, I'm a good father. Freedom means I'm a good father. Number three means I'm a good husband. And four, freedom means working hard and doing what I can do for myself. What's missing? What's missing? Isn't that sad? Didn't that break your heart? Anybody want to guess what the believer said? Number one, he said Christ's redemption. That's what freedom means to me. Number two, the Holy Spirit. The direction and the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives us gives that's what freedom means to me. Number three, he said, freedom from chains. Freedom from chains. And number four, peace and, ass and assurance. Freedom means that I'm assured of who I'm serving. Freedom means that Christ gives me peace to walk in his his way and his light always kiddos can you say his light it breaks my heart to know that when people think of freedom they think of themselves It makes me happy to know we have believers that say, Him. Him. Glory to God. Glory to God. This battle we're in is getting intense, y'all. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Playtime's over with. I just seen... I just seen those churches in this country right now that are letting drag queens come in and teach Sunday school. Not just story time no more. Sunday school. Enough's enough. It's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 11, 19 through 21. You shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road 
when you lay down, when you rise up. He's talk. What's he talking about there? What are you teaching? What are you teaching your sons and your daughters? The word of God. Talking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk alongside the road, when you lay down, when you rise up. Always have the word of God on your lips. Always. You know why? Because the children need to know. When we go to battle, those kids are going to be with us in battle. They're going to they're going to need to know how to battle, how to fight. And how do we fight with the sword? We're we're learning the the full armor of God in kids church. What's the sword of God, y'all? Kids, the sword of God. We haven't got to it yet, but we we talked about it briefly. The sword the sword of God the sword of God is what Okay, you remember the Bible. That's right. That's right. So when we go to battle, we take the Bible, right? And whack. <laughs> We're Bible thumpers. <laughs> Amen. I'm in. So I'm proud. I, I I've seen there a few times. She come to me after. I'd like to get that. The Bible thumped them. I said, Aaron. <laughs> Verse 20, it says, You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You know, we're talking about, we've been focusing on gatekeepers. And we came together from, uh, you know, we, the gates in Kansas City, the gates in St. Joe, and I think we've got east and west covered too, right? What must we be gatekeepers? How do we, how do we become gate? How are we gatekeepers? By the word of God. And we must have them on the gates. We must have them on the doorpost. Amen. Verse 21, so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to his, to your father to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. That's a promise, y'all. Amen. We thank you for